Hey, hey, good morning team. Let's get into some new types of bonding. So we spent the whole last 10 video or something like that looking at Lewis theory, which is a fantastic theory, but it's a little bit simplistic. We'll talk about some of the weaknesses in that in a second. So before we get into more advanced models of bonding, advanced you know theories, let's review a little bit. Let's get our our qualitative picture of bonding together and show you where the Lewis theory kind of fails in a couple of those aspects. So again, this is think of these as electrostatic forces, right? We've got atom number one with nucleus and electrons, atom number two, nucleus and electrons, and the nucleus are the positive protons, neutral neutrons, electron clouds are negative. So we've got a lot of different types of electrostatic forces, and you guys know like charges repel, opposite charges attract. So let's try to make this as easy as possible three main types of attractive and repulsive forces that hold these atoms together. And that force that holds them together is the chemical bond, right? So let's say we've got a nucleus here with a certain number of protons given by Z and it's positive. We've got another atom over here with a nucleus with some Z that could be the same atoms like a diatomic molecule or different. So it's got a certain number of protons. You could use hydrogen to really make it simplistic, but whatever it is. And then we've got electron clouds. So in this case, I just drew two, but this could be one electron, 25 electrons, whatever. You just got these electrons here, right? So this new positive nucleus, negative electrons, positive nucleus, negative electrons, and they're coming closer together. We're going to draw some energetics of this in a second. But would you agree that the electron clouds of atom number one are going to be repelled by the electron clouds of atom number two? They're both negative, right? So they're not going to be like to be overlapping too much. So that's a repulsive force electron electron repulsion so that they 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 don't want to come together in that scenario well same with the nuclei there's a high repulsive force between the protons and the nucleus of atom number 1 and the protons and the nucleus of atom number 2 so like, it's like trying to take you know when i was a kid at my grandma's house i'd take two magnets and flip it so that the the south side was to the south side and you're like yeah uh. Oh, you can never get them. And the closer you got, the harder it was. You're like, all right, that's like two nuclei coming in. They're like, no, they don't want to get close to each other. But the negative electron cloud of atom number one is attracted to the positive nucleus of atom number two. And the negative electron cloud of atom number two is attracted to the positive nucleus of atom number one. Right. So three kinds of forces, but four total. Right. So you got electron-electron repulsions, proton-proton repulsions, or nucleus-nucleus repulsions. And then the third type, there's actually two. The electrons here are attracted to that nucleus, and the electron here are attracted to that nucleus. Nature always goes to the lowest energy state, so it will find a distance that tries to minimize the repulsions yet maximize the attraction. So you got this complex interplay between all these different electrostatic forces. Let's draw a little graph of that and show you where nature goes to the lowest energy state. Coming right to you. All right, get your pens or pencils or whatever writing tinsel you're using out. Let's graphically put together what we just talked about, right? As we bring two, let's say we got two separated atoms. Oh, gotta keep them separated, right? So we got two separated atoms. And we're going to bring them together, and let's look at the interplay between the electron-electron repulsions, nucleus-nucleus repulsions, and then the electron-nucleus attraction, and then electron-nucleus attraction between the two different atoms. So you got really three types of forces, but two are attractive um, between the electron cloud nucleus, electron cloud nucleus. Those are attractive, and then the repulsive forces between the electron clouds and the nuclei. Let's start them out at infinite distance, and let's call that, define that as zero. We looked at that in earlier chapters, right? So we defined when we were looking at Bohr models, an electron that's been detached from uh, an atom as zero energy, that kind of thing. So let's define this as a reference state. Let's take zero. So we got our bond energy, right? So there's a bond energy. Nature wants to go to the lowest energy state and the internuclear distance. Let's plot that. So, so let's start out at uh, infinite distance, and let's bring them close, not quite drawn to scale, right? Infinity would go quite a while. So let's say they're infinitely distant, and they're getting closer and closer together, and then we're going to start to see this interplay of forces. So this is the internuclear distance, and we'll bring it to, you know, as close to zero, like trying to get those two magnets together, <laughs> and it doesn't work. And let's look at how the bond energy changes. Think of that as the bond dissociation energy. Let's call zero...
let's define zero energy as atoms at infinite distance, right? And so obviously, lower energy is going to go down to the negative, higher energy to the positive. Nature wants to go lower. So let's follow this. I'll do this in, let's say, blue. <clears throat> Right? So as they're getting together, we're going to get some electron-electron repulsions between the two atoms, but the electrons on one atom are attracted to the nucleus on the other, and the electrons on the other are attracted to the, uh, the nucleus of that one. But the protons are really, remember, the protons are little tiny things, so the protons aren't even probably aware of each other way right out here. Proton-proton repulsion really doesn't come into play until you get really, really close, right? Because they're so tiny. It's mostly electron-electron repulsions and electron nucleus attractions. So we're going to start to see this, this electron-proton attraction kind of dominate at this point. So you're going to see this starting at zero, and then you're going to start to see these attractive forces here dominate. So as we're moving down this curve, we'll see these attractive forces as they're coming together. Like, hey, I'm liking this, right? And so they're coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down. And then all of a sudden, we're getting close enough where the nuclei start to sense each other, right? So it kind of tails off. And then we're starting to get too close where these proton, pro, the protons in the nucleus of the first one and the protons in the nucleus of the other one are starting to repulse each other. And like those two magnets with the same south to south, ugh, this actually just shoots up. Boom! So this direction is repulsive. Right? Shooting up to higher energies, lower energies. It's not the smoothest curve ever, but hey, you get the idea. Well, if you look at this, let's say you're these two atoms, and you want to go to the lowest energy state, where would you like to be as far as how apart? Let's see, lowest, lowest, lowest. If I roll the ball, it would go there. Hey, isn't that nice? So right here, I had a red pin once. That is your lowest energy state. That's called your bond dissociation energy right here. Remember we looked at bond dissociation energies, right? How much energy it takes to break a bond apart? But you would take the, the uh, negative of that. Bond dissociation energies are positive. So if you take the negative of that, that would be the bond dissociation energy. Uh, I'll put negative of that. All right, well, let's look at the internuclear distance. Boop, 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 boop. This is our lowest energy. So that's where they're going to sit. Now, they do vibrate, right? So it's not constant, but that would be like an average. So it lengthens and shrinks and lengthens. But the average bond energy would be right about there, which gives you the lowest energy state. That would be the bond length. Isn't that right? So if we get a good bonding model, we should be able to get the bond length and the bond energy from that, ideally, quantitatively. And typically, the, the internuclear distance is given in picometers. It used to be in angstroms back when I was in school. And so this would be a scenario where you've got the two atoms bonded together. Here, they're getting, you're starting to squish them too much. So they're just ew, too repulsive. So that's our spot right there. It'd be nice to get a model that could give us some quantitative information on that. So let's take a look at how the Lewis model answers these questions and some of the flaws in it, and then I'll introduce you to a couple of more advanced models we're going to be looking at in the next few videos. All right, let's look back at the Lewis model, the Lewis theory, we, we, which was fantastic, right? It really works good. It's simplified, but there's a few things we had to do some fudge factors on, right? Well, one, if you look at that plot we did, Lewis theory doesn't give us diddly squat quantitative information on bond energies or bond lengths, which were the two things we wanted from that graph, right? What's that lowest energy as it comes in, as they come together? What's the bottom of that curve, right? What's that bond length and what's that bond energy? It can't find that. It does give us information on bond angles, yay, which is you know, good enough if you're looking at qualitative things. So most of us in the undergraduate level, Lewis theory is perfectly good. 
Remember, we had some issues with resonance structure, structures. We couldn't draw a, we had to draw all different resonance structures. And when we had, you know, multiple bonds, being able to put them in different places, and we could kind of predict with formal charges, which is the best one or contributes most. But the realistic structure is a blending of all of those. So, yeah, we kind of fudged that one a little bit, but it was okay. Uh, odd electron species, we did fine with what I talked about, but if you open up the ugly door a little bit, there's some issues there. Not going to go into it. We didn't talk about bonding in metals, but it turns out Lewis theory doesn't, blah, <laughs> right? doesn't work real well at all for that. Um, we might briefly jaunt into bonding in metals and show you why this model doesn't work real well. And then you know, in relation to that, semiconductors, which is a fantastic field. I actually worked in that to pay my way through undergraduate college. I you know, work all day, you know, do my track, do my choir, uh, do all my classes, and then at night, uh, I would work at a company where they manufactured um, semiconductor, the little semiconductor, semiconductor wafers, and they'd make the transistors on it. And we had this multiple step process. I don't know how much I can actually talk about, but it was quite fascinating. I worked from about 10 o'clock at night till, you know, two-ish in the morning or whatever, and then get up for my eight o'clock class every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, ah! <laughs> eight to nine, another one, nine to 10, another one, 10 to 11, track practice, choir practice, do the, it was just, the things we go through are just insane, but what a neat process on the semiconductor chemistry in the computer field, fascinating field, uh, but eh, Lewis theory, not quite good enough for that. So let me introduce uh, where we're going to be headed with a more, sophist more sophisticated bonding models. Yay, let's go to it. All right, so we are going to uh, take a glimpse, not gory details. We're just going to introduce you to these because you're going to hit these really hard in organic chemistry. All right, but uh, I will introduce them to you to give you enough working knowledge to understand the concept and maybe do some simple stuff. Uh, and then when you, uh, when or if, right, you move up to organic chemistry, you're not lost when you walk in the door. And, they, and you're like, what are you talking about? At least you'll have some rudimentary knowledge of these more advanced models. For general chemistry, typically the Lewis theory is perfectly fine <laughs> for, for most of it. All right. So the first advanced or more sophisticated model will be the valence bond method. I'm going to say with hybridization. So instead, and we'll do a whole uh, video on that, but instead of using atomic orbitals, overlapping like we've been doing we're going to use what are called hybrid hybrid orbitals what are those you're going to learn that in the next video ha <laughs> ha right. well next two videos and then we're going to do probably the best i would say the one that explains science uh, experimental data the best would be molecular orbital theory or the infamous mo more mo the mo theory mo theory molecular orbital theory and that one, instead of using atomic orbitals or hybridized atomic orbitals, they're actually going to use molecular orbitals, which makes sense because when the atoms are separate, they're atoms, they have atomic orbitals. When they come together, they've made a molecule, right? So they use molecular orbitals. So we're going to do some really funky electron configurations. We kind of come back to electron configurations, but using molecular orbitals instead of atomic orbitals. There's your review. Let's get into the juicy stuff, guys.